2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Peter is speaking. He says, For this reason I will not be diligent to remind you always of these things. You know, we have to remind each other of the things of God. This is one of the reasons that we want to come to church on a regular, persistent way because certain things have a way of just slipping your mind and the devil will rob the Word of God out of your heart, out of your mind, and this is why we're to guard our heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And so we have to remind each other that God loves us. We have to remind each other that we're children of God, that this home, this, uh, this uh, place down here we call earth is not our home. We're only passing through. And we're pilgrims down here. We have to remind each other of those things. And Peter knows that. And he says, though you know and are established in the present truth. Someone said, well, I've heard that before, Bob. I, yeah, I know you have. But you need to hear it again and again and again until it takes root, until it gets so in our being that we will not forget. And uh, so remember that. Some uh, messages, you said, well, I've heard that before. Yeah, you need to hear it again and again because faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. And hearing comes by the Word of God. So, yes, I think it is right. Peter says, I think it's right. As long as I am in this tent, that is, notice this, I am in this tent. I am in this tent. I am in this body. I is the real Peter. But the, uh, but the tent is his body. So that's why when this body uh, quits functioning, then we can get out of here and go to heaven and live there forever. Okay, so we see here, absent from the body, present with the Lord also. He says, uh, as long as I am in this tent or this body, to stir you up by reminding you. To stir you up by reminding you. How are we going to stir up people? Somebody tell me. By reminding them of these things. Stir people up in the faith by reminding them, hey, God loves you. You're God's child. And then it goes in in verse 13. Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent. And I've shared that. Verse 14, knowing that shortly, now this is something he knew, that shortly he was going to depart this life, lay this old tent down, and go to heaven. He knew that. <laughs> and he goes on and says, Moreover, I will be careful uh, to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things, after my decease, even after I'm gone, after this tent is in the, in the earth and I'm with the Lord, I'm going to have some folks around here to remind you. I'm going to write this word down to remind you of these things. And so I want to let this be our springboard this morning to remind you, and I want to remind you of some things as your pastor that, uh, that I think will strengthen you in your faith. Now, a lot of people don't, don't like to talk about Satan. But unless we know his devices, unless we know his schemes, uh, if we're ignorant of those devices and those schemes, then we will, be, we will fall into his trap. <coughs> so the way that we cannot be ignorant is to get into the Word of God and know his schemes, know what he's trying to do in our lives to keep us from serving God. Now, I want to talk about some ways that Satan will try to stop you. That'll be the title of this message. Ways that Satan will try to stop you. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians 4. Everybody, 2 Corinthians 4. This will probably be more of a teaching than a preaching. 2 Corinthians, everybody there. Chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. And look what Paul says. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds, and notice this, who minds the God of this age. Now, who is the God of this age? Satan. And what has he done? Has blinded who do not believe. 
lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So the first thing that Satan does is that he blinds the minds of the unbelievers. Now, we were unbelievers. Every one of us in here at one time was unbelievers. And the God of this world blinded us of the glorious light of the gospel. But because of God's grace and his mercy, because I really believe people prayed for us and the enemy's power was broken over us and the, and the spirit of wisdom and revelation came upon us and God showed us who Christ is and we realized that we were sinners. We realized that we were going our own way and we repented, which means we turned 180 degrees and stopped living our life for ourselves, but started living our life for him, putting our faith and trust in Christ, and Christ gave us the right to become sons of God, and we became born again, and we were now alive unto God. And now we serve him. So when you're out there in the world, you got to realize, you might say, why doesn't that person believe? You know the answer. The God of this world has blinded them from the glorious light of the gospel. And that's where you begin to pray for them. And you bind the enemy, the God of this world, over their lives. <coughs> that the light of the gospel will shine into them and they can see their condition before God that they're sinners, they're lost, they're damned, and they're going to hell. And that's not God's will. And that's why we're here preaching the gospel. For it's God's will that no man perish, but that, have, that all should come to repentance and turn to God in repentance from their old way of life of doing things and now totally, absolutely living for the glory of God. Now, you realize that they're blind and they do not see that. And so this is where our prayer life is very important, that we begin to pray and bind the enemy power over their lives, that the gospel, the glorious light of the gospel will shine into them and they can see their present condition without Christ. But the enemy will try to stop us from praying for him, and he'll try to stop them from going uh, uh, and reading the Bible and seeking God, and he will keep them blinded that they may end up in a burning hell, and that is not God's will for no boy or no girl or no man or no woman. How many of you know there's a hell to shun and a heaven to gain? Amen? So sometimes when you are Like, you know, this is a routine coming to church. You know, this is a routine serving God. Well, it's a good routine. <laughs> you better stop and think. You were once lost. You were, you were once blinded by the God of this world, heading for hell, and God broke through to you and showed you the light of the gospel that if you would repent of your sins, and receive Christ as your personal Savior, then the God of this world will no more be your master, but you'll have a new master, and that'll be Jesus Christ. So you need to stop, and I want to remind you of these things this morning, that we are a blessed people, that we know that when we die, we're not going to hell, but we're going to heaven, and that's something to shout about. Amen? So we want to bring each other in the remembrance of these things because sometimes, you know, we can lose track of some important things that will keep us in track as we think and realize that Satan uh, wants to uh, keep us blind, blinded. But I am so glad this morning that God saved me. I love to hear Susan's testimony, a little girl out in the country, Conway, South Carolina. They put a, it was a Halloween night. And uh, she was saved that night. They put this tent up. Susan was blinded. She didn't know she was even lost. 
the God of this world has blinded her. She was about 14 years old. And she went to a tent meeting, not knowing that it was God leading her to where she could hear the gospel preached. For how many of you know, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And so what God did in his mercy and grace directed that young little 14-year-old girl to that tent meeting. And there she's sitting, sawdust on the floor, sitting on benches with no back in it. And the uh, preacher was preaching on the sowing of the word. And at that moment, the power of gospel of Jesus Christ broke the hold of Satan over her mind. And she saw she was lost, undone, bound to hell. And she saw God's mercy and grace and saw the Lord Jesus Christ nailed to the cross, blood coming down his face, his hands, onto the sawdust. She ran to the altar and gave her life to Christ, passed from darkness into light in a moment of time by the power of God. That's why it's so important that we bring these things to our remembrance because it'll help us to stay on the right road. Amen? All right. Now, let's turn to Luke 16. Luke 16. It's a good scripture. That's in the New Testament. Let's start with verse 19. I want to bring to your remembrance this morning that when you were saved, what you escaped from, because I believe it will cause you to be more thankful that when it's time to get up on Sunday morning, you'll have a little skip in your foot and not just drag to church. Amen. Come on, love me a little bit anyway. <laughs> you know, did you hear about the guy that uh, had a drug problem when he was young? And uh, he, he had a deep drug problem. He was eight, nine, ten years old. He always had a drug problem when he was a child. And uh, the man said, you had a drug problem? Yeah. He said, yeah, I got saved, though. And uh, now I don't have to be drugged to church no more. I come with my own free will. That's when you know you're really saved. You're not like the preacher. You're not like the preacher. And, the, and his wife says, honey, it's time to go to church. I don't want to go to church. But you've got to go to church. Why? Why do I have to go to church? Because you're the preacher. No, we come to church because God says, forget not the assembling of yourself together as the manner of some have. Sheer obedience. But I don't feel like it. You go anyway. I feel like it. You go anyway. No, we know that, 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 that you don't understand what I'm talking about. You know, you got a heart attack. We don't expect you to get up and come to church. Rest a little bit. Get your heart straight. Then come. Yeah, we understand that. But normally, persistently, See, because you see, one of the tricks of the enemy that if he couldn't stop you from getting saved, he'll try to stop you from coming to the house of God where you can be fed the word of the Lord and, be, and these things brought to your remembrance where you can grow and mature and, and be conformed into the image of the Son of God. So if he can't stop you from being saved, he'll do everything he can to stop you from coming to church. I've been in this thing a long time. When I see people start moving backwards like that, now I know there's people who have to work. I understand how raising three children in a family and working. How many of you know, look at me? I wasn't born yesterday. You can tell I know that. I know all of those things, backwards and forwards. But you're home and ain't nothing wrong with you. The devil's going to try his best to keep you home. How many have I lost already this morning? We're thinning these chairs out, aren't we? See, the devil, the devil doesn't want you to come to church because when you come to church, you can encourage the saints. You can learn. You can obey God. How many in here, how many mothers do we have here? Let me see your hands. All right. 
Let's say you got 10 children. I wouldn't wish that on nobody, but let's just say you got 10 children, okay? We're going to get to this scripture. You just hold on. I'm preparing you for it. <laughs> you got 10 kids, and you fix a nice meal for them, and nobody shows up. How do you feel? Huh? I mean, I mean, you got steak on the table, you got corn on the cob, you got cob off the corn, you got okra, uh, you got banana pudding, you got the whole nine yards, and you invite the whole congregation to your house to eat, and nobody shows up. How would you feel? Some of you are not. Oh, you, I've lost you. I can tell I've lost you. You're way out. Uh huh. Huh? See, you got to understand the other. God's feelings in this thing and the teacher's feelings in this thing, you see? So the devil will do everything he can to stop you from learning, coming to church, encouraging the saints, and being used by God. How many of you know that? Because it is a struggle. Now, let's be honest for about 30 seconds. How many this morning really struggled to get to church? Let me see your hands. All right, just one honest. Look at the honest. Okay, raise your hands. I know it. It's all right. That's all. God love you. I love you. I'll come on, kiss you. Susan said, Susan, I'm sorry, darling. Susan said, don't ever say that. Because she, she knows some sister will come up, and, 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 and I know okay, Frank's back there. Hold him, hold him back there, Linda. See, now that, that, see, the struggle is there. But let me, can I help you? Set it in your mind. You're going to go as long as you're, I'm mean, talking about healthy and strong, you're going to church. See, if you don't, listen to me, if you don't, the enemy will always hound you in that area. Okay? Always hound you. Now, how many has to be drugged to the table to eat? Let me see your hands. How many in here, in here after the service, you're going to eat? Let me see your hands. How many in here is not going to eat? Fasting? I'm going to eat. But right now, I'm eating the Word of God. I'm sharing the Word of God. See, we've got to come to understand that we have an enemy, and if he can't stop you from being saved, he'll stop you from serving God and being persistent in the things of God and therefore miss the blessings of God. Okay? Now, how many in here are bosses on the job? Got a boss over here or here? Look, you got bosses. You got somebody that's uh, faithful. Christmas time, you're going to reach back to your wallet and probably give them a bonus, aren't you? Norm, I mean, if you had the money, you give them a bonus. But you got somebody sluggish, never faithful, drags in, drags out. Boy, this is good preaching, isn't it? I tell you, huh? What you going to give them, huh? <laughs> Pink slip, somebody said. Amen. Amen. See, we got to see ourselves in the message, not for condemnation to see. Wow, the enemy's been working on me, and I didn't even know that that was one of his vices. Amen? All right, let's read this encouraging word here. <clears throat> now, Jesus is speaking. This is not a parable. This is a real story. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Now, during the Old Testament times, when a man died or a woman died, they went down into a compartment in the underworld called Abraham's bosom. And that's where they were, down there, okay? Now, hell is also down there, and between Abraham's bosom and hell, there's a big gulf. So once you get into one compartment, you can't get into the other. That's, that's, your, 
That's your future. That's your destiny. You're locked in, believe me, okay? And he goes on and says, The rich man also died and was buried. That is, his physical body was buried, but his spirit went down into Hades, into hell. Now notice this, verse 23, he's conscious. He's down there in hell, and he's conscious. You say, Bob, I don't like this. Yeah, I don't really like it either. But you know, we got to face the truth. Hello? This is God's Word. See, I'm bringing you this to your attention for you to get happy about your salvation. <laughs> You're going to miss this place because you've repented and you are trusting Christ and living for Him. So let's give the Lord a praise. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is what we're going to miss. We're going to miss this party. All right, look at this. Verse 23. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So in the underworld, the two compartments. One, Abraham's bosom. The other one, hell, Hades. The rich man went to Hades. Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom. All right. Now, when Christ was crucified and he was the first fruit and he was resurrected, then we know those people in Abraham's bosom ascended up into heaven and now heaven uh, is where uh, paradise is now. And when a Christian dies in the New Testament era, then our bodies go right to be with the Lord uh, in paradise in heaven. All right, look at verse 24. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am, I am tormented in this flame. Now, boy, I mean to tell you, we're going to miss this party. How many of you uh, say, praise you, Jesus? Praise you. You, you see, when Jesus came, he realized because of sin that man has to be born again to escape this place. So not only when you look at the cross, you remember this, that he delivered you from your sins, but he delivered you from the wrath of God, and he delivered you from this place called hell. Okay? Now, let's move on. It seems like a hot place to me, and a little water would cool my tongue, and I am tormented in this flame. For how long? Three years? No. A hundred years? No. Throughout eternity. So you see how serious it is that we understand our position in Christ and understand that there's a hell to shun and a heaven to gain, and it's for eternity. See, we need to have these things brought to our remembrance to understand what we are doing each day of our life living for the Lord, because the enemy has a way of deceiving people and making them think they're going to miss out on all the fun, knowing that that is what they will have to face one day. All right, look at the Bible again, verse 25. And Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things, but now he is uh, comforted, and you are tormented. Look at verse 26. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, a great space between these two compartments, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. So once you're locked into one area in the underworld or in these compartments, you could not pass to the other. But you could see over this great gulf. Verse 27, Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Now, he was down there. He was in torment. He began to think about his brothers. He didn't want them to come. And uh, he wanted to get the word back to them. Hey, straighten up, get right, get converted, repent, serve God, get saved. And what did Abraham say? Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. 
let them hear them. Notice this. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But look what the word of the Lord says. But he said to them, that is Abraham said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded the one rise from the dead. So we have the word of God, we have the prophets, we have Moses, and if we do not believe Moses and the prophets and the word of God, even though somebody comes uh, out from the dead and tells us, we won't believe it. Aren't you glad you're a believer? Aren't you glad we're going to miss this? Aren't you glad I brought it to your attention? Because sometimes, the enemy so works in our minds and tries to deceive the people of God that they think they can do just whatever they want to do and not serve the Lord and not be honest with God, not render unto God what belongs to God and render unto man what belongs to man. Little by little, that deception comes in. And I've seen people drift off and drift off. And I can give names right now, people that came to this church, 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 15 years ago. They don't serve God. They're out there in the world totally, absolutely living their life like they want to. So I'm here to remind every one of us, including myself, there is a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. But thank God we have a Savior that paid the price, satisfied the Father, and we can keep our mind and keep trusting God. So we have to watch out for that. Now, I want to share, if you will, another area that God will, that the devil will try to stop you to do. Uh, I want you to turn, if you will, <coughs> excuse me, to 2 uh, Timothy 2.15. 2 Timothy 2.15. Now, the Word of God is so powerful. The enemy will do everything he can to keep you out of the Word of God. 2.15, everybody there. What else will the devil try to do? He will try to stop you from uh, spending time in the Word. Everybody said, spend time in the Word. How many of you know that if you don't get your proper rest, how many has been crabby? You know what a crabby means. If you don't get the proper rest, you become crabby. If you don't eat the proper food, you won't be healed. Or uh, back up. You won't have any strength physically to make it through the day. So there are certain things, whether we like it or not, thank you, we have to do, okay, for health's sake. Okay, now, if the word to you is law, then you're going to bring yourself into death. Now listen to this. If it's law to you, you will bring yourself into death. But if it is life to you, it will bring you into joy unspeakable. If the word is, 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 is uh, come to that place that it is life to you, when, when you hear about a command of the Lord, it, it's, oh, I don't perceive it as a law. No, you perceive it as life. That as you practice that word, life comes, health comes, strength comes. We must have the right perspective of God's word. If you don't, then you will move in death, for the law will bring death to you. So the word of God to me is not law, it is life. It is the very, the very principles of God that will cause me to have deep re, uh, relationships with God and with God's people. So we have to have the right perspective. Now listen, the enemy, this is an area in our lives that the enemy will try to keep us from. Notice this, be diligent to present yourself approved to God a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, this is why we have to guard our heart, for out of it are the issues of life. And it's one thing, if you'll notice over in the sowing of the seed, how the enemy 
would rob the word of God out of the hearts of the people, and they bared no fruit. So I want to remind you uh, of that also. Now, another area that uh, we need to understand and conceive is I want to remind you that God has made us righteous in his sight. Turn, if you will, to uh, 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. Let's start with verse. Let's, let's start with verse uh, 17. This is uh, tremendous. Now there's one thing that we all have understood that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And yet, when we come to Christ and all our, our sins are forgiven, God causes our inner man to be born again. And he gives us the right to become children of God. Uh, St. John 1.12. And let's read this, starting with verse 17. And I want to remind you, and this is where we are launching the message from, to bring us into remembrance of what the Lord has done for us. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, years ago, as a young Christian, I read that. And boy, I tell you, everything inside of me seemed like it was old. <laughs> it was old stuff manifesting more and more and more uh, in my life. And I didn't, I didn't understand that my spirit was saved, but in the soul and the flesh area, uh, it wasn't saved yet. And that's a process uh, in our soul area uh, to be cleansed, uh, all that negative stuff to be cleansed out. And we take on the mind of Christ, which is the Word of God. And then one day, of course, our physical bodies will be saved in the future tense. But you've got to start seeing it as God sees you. So when you come to Christ, He sees you absolutely forgiven. He sees you righteous in His sight. And that's the way we got to begin to see ourselves. And what happens is God will work that into us that we actually become what he says we are in Christ, okay? And it becomes experimental. Just as Judy brought that word this morning, as we begin to line up with the word of God and say what the word of God says about us, then we're able to come in to the things of the spirit. Now, uh, look at verse 18. Now, all these things are of God. We didn't save ourselves. The Bible says we're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's God's goodness, God's mercy. He called us. He saved us. Now, we had to repent. We had to turn 180 degrees and turn to the Lord and begin to live according to the Word of God. Now, all these things are of God, who has reconciled us. That word reconciled means made friendly again. We're now friends of God. God is not mad at us. Uh, we've been made uh, friends of God. Uh, it says, and reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So when we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, we let them know that God's not mad at nobody anymore, that he has provided salvation. Now, he does not like their sins, but he loves them. In fact, the Bible says, while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. Not while we were yet saints, but while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And he reconciled us while we were yet sinners. And we have to accept that by faith and realize that we've been made uh, friendly again to the Lord. Or right, look at the uh, verse uh, 19. That is, uh, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So our job is to invite people to come and receive Christ, what he has done for them, and to receive that reconciliation and to uh, be reconciled back to God and begin to live for him. Look at verse 20. And then we are ambassadors for Christ, 
as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And that's what we do as we preach the gospel. We implore people, get, be reconciled, repent of your sins, come to Christ. He's paid the penalty. He satisfied the Father by dying on that cross. And look at verse 21. For he made him, that is Christ, who knew, knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so our position now, uh, we used to be sinners. We used to be in the kingdom of darkness. But the Bible says he's translated us out of the kingdom of of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of God. We were once sinners, but now we're saints of God. We used to be unrighteous, but now we are righteous with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And you have to accept it all by faith. And as you do, the Holy Spirit works it into the fiber of your being, and then you don't have to try to be anything. You are because it's been worked into you and it's just a natural thing to do right. Do we see that? Okay. It's simple. It's not complicated. So, but you've got to accept it by faith and walk in it each day. And as you do, then it's just, it just begins to bubble up inside. It's just that's the thing to do. That's your desire to do it. It's no strain uh, anymore uh, to try to do it. So I'm bringing this to our remembrance, what the Lord has done for us, uh, and it is a a tremendous, tremendous uh, thing. Now, the next scripture I want us to turn to, and I'll let you be finished here in just a little bit. I want you to turn to Romans 12. Romans 12. This is more of a teaching this morning. I want to bring to your remembrance this morning the importance of having our minds renewed. And let's read this scripture. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. Now he's talking to Christians, and you might never have done this. But here again, it's the doer of the word that will be blessed. He's saying, present your bodies. A living sacrifice, not a dead one, but a a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. All right? Now, what does that mean? That means that we uh, use our bodies to serve the Lord. Not not, uh, the devil anymore, but we use our bodies to serve the Lord. And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, I want to read that same passage uh, in the Message Bible, and I believe it will really stir your heart. Romans 12, verse 1. Listen to this. This is in the Message Bible. Place your life before God. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life. You're sleeping, you're eating, going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. So whatever we do, we do all for the glory of God. Working at your job is just as spiritual, for all things are really spiritual, just as spiritual as coming to church. And we need to realize that everything we do, we do all for the glory of God, and we do it with a good attitude and uh, and a good uh, disposition. All right, you're sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Now, that's committing uh, your body uh, as a living sacrifice before the Lord. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture or this world that you fit into it 
without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you and develops well-formed maturity in you. I'm speaking to you out of deep gratitude for all that God has given me, and especially as I have responsibilities in relation to you, living then as every one of you does in pure grace. It's important that you not misinterpret yourself as people who are bringing uh, the goodness to God. No, God brings it all to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what he does for us, not by what we are and what we do for him. In this way, we are like the various parts of a human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. The body we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. Each of us finds our meaning and function as a part of his body. But as a chopped off finger or cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, would we? So since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellent formed and marvelous functioning parts in Christ's body, let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other or trying to be something we're not. If you preach, just preach God's message, nothing else. If you help, just help, don't take over. If you teach, stick to your teaching. If you give encouraging guidance, be careful that you don't get bossy. If you put in, in charge, don't be manipulated. If you call if you're called to give and to, and to the people in distress, keep your eyes open and be quick to respond. If you work with the disadvantage, don't let yourself get irritated and then, and then and with them or be depressed by them. Keep a smile on your face. Love from the center of who you are. Don't, take, don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil. Hold on for... Dear life to good, be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. Don't have to be the first guy on the block. Don't burn out. That's a good one. <laughs> Keep yourself fueled and aflame. Be alert, servants of the master, cheerfully expecting. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Help needy Christians be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies, no cursing under your breath. Laugh with your happy friends when they're happy. Share your tears when they're down. Get along with each other. Don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies. Don't be the great somebody. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. If you got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, God says. I'll take care of it. Our scriptures tell us that if you see your enemy's hunger, go buy that person lunch. Or if he's thirsty, give him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him with goodness. Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. That's the Message Bible on chapter 12. Father, we want to thank you, Lord, that you have brought many things to our attention this morning. You have brought your word to our remembrance, and we thank you for that. And Lord, as we encourage each other each day to walk into faith, and we thank you, Lord, that your spirit reminds us many times of the word of God. And we just give you praise and we give you glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's stand to our feet.